much for the ride along. As always, we have an amazing guest lined up, Miss Denise Barker. Uh, she got her degree in civil engineering from the University of Illinois, where she worked as a structural engineer for Bechtel and later for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, she actually then attended seminary and became an ordained clergy in the United Methodist Church. From there, she would actually go on to found and serve as the executive director of the Magdalena House, which is a nonprofit transitional shelter in San Antonio for women and children uh, fleeing violence and abuse. While she's also concurrently working on her doctorate in the field of violence against women. So to say she has done a lot across a lot of different fields is you know, doesn't even really encapsulate it all. So thank you again for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. And uh, you know, to really get started, just you know, why did you decide to go into nonprofits? Could you kind of talk about a little bit more in depth on your career journey and what that's looked like from your own perspective? Well, that's a good question because when I was young, um, it really, I didn't, I'd never heard of a nonprofit. I, you know, I, I, I wasn't involved. I certainly kind of did some volunteer stuff as a kid and as a high school uh, person and maybe a little bit in college, but, but primarily got connected to nonprofits when I was a young adult. I started my career, I actually was a, a, a civil engineer um, working primarily in the structural engineering field. I didn't really do hydraulics or anything, um, but I worked for Bechtel Engineering mm -hmm. and um, well, actually, before that, I will tell you, I started out, I was an architect. Maybe I just didn't know what I wanted to be when I yeah. came Maybe that's the, probably the, the short answer for our uh -huh. whole interview. But when I, I started out in architecture, and, and I loved uh, I loved architecture because I loved the creativity side of it, but I really loved math. So it's like, you know, I think I'll do structural engineering, you know, uh -huh. or I could get a master's in architecture and do structural work and, as an architect. And um, mm -hmm. But I, I, be, I began, I liked to build things, I guess. I liked, I was, I... I liked the creative side. Um, mm -hmm. I was. I liked art. I, so there was something about architecture that was creative, but it didn't mm -hmm. really touch that logical side of my brain, that math okay. side. And so um, that's why I ended up in civil engineering and worked for Bechtel Engineering. I did mostly. Uh, in, I was in the indust the uh, industrial world of. Uh, petrochemical and the petro, petrochemical industry uh -huh. and then later that was in Houston and then later I worked in the nuclear energy outside of Philadelphia I worked on constructing a new I did design work for a nuclear power plant outside of Philadelphia not three mile island gotcha but, okay so did you have to kind of decide in college between like architectural and civil engineering or had you kind of started yeah, deciding I, in high school maybe I kind of, did, yeah. I, I did a lot of, when I was in architecture, and it was that's a pretty intensive field in terms of right. project work and lots of all-nighters and a yeah. lot of cut fingers with the exacto knife building projects. Mm -hmm. but I, I just really liked the structural side of it. I really thought I thought I might like to do high rises or you know, you know, high office buildings, tall buildings, and that really required a structural background as an architect. I really I learned that sometimes as an architect. Um, for better or for worse, you're at the clients, you know, you're working yeah. with the client and right. you're kind of at their, um, their will, you know, there's, uh -huh. there's a certain amount of creativity, but in the real everyday life of an architect, um, I thought, ah, maybe this isn't really what I want to do. I really want to do structural work. Right. And so when I was a senior in, in college, I changed to uh, structural engineer to civil engineering is the underlying. Well, that must have been stressful your senior year having to. Yeah, I took all my electives in architecture, all my hard courses in architecture became right. my engineering electives. And okay. then I had to take, I took like, I think I would take five classes of solid engineering. So it was a, it was a push, you know, it's still right. took an extra year to get out of college when I made that switch my senior year. Uh -huh. um, then I, I, you know, I interviewed around in different fields and, um, ended up working for Bechtel Engineering out of their mm -hmm. Houston office. So they're based out of San Francisco. At least they were. They're an international firm. And um, and I did petrochemical work. My father was a chemical engineer. And so, you know, maybe yeah, I was... Kind of ran the blood a little bit. Maybe I just need to sort of be the oldest, you know, uh -huh. oldest male or something. I don't know what it was. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but I ended up doing that. I worked for Bechtel in the Houston office and did petrochem work. And then when the petro... In, in engineering, there's an ebb and tide of the energy industries. And so oftentimes engineers are faced with um, sometimes layoffs if that particular form of energy takes a hit. And at the time, the, pet, the oil industry had taken a hit in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up going into nuclear, the nuclear world, which was, which was advancing in the United States. And I worked on designing a plant up in the Philadelphia area. And, gotcha. and I enjoyed it, but um, I ended up coming back to Houston. Mm -hmm. Um, actually, I um, moved back to Houston, became engaged to another person who was an engineer who also made a switch into wow. medicine. And so uh -huh. 
I was surrounded by a lot of engineers, but mm -hmm. eventually it, as an engineer, when I was working in Houston, I was working with the Corps of Engineers um, doing flood control studies for the city of Houston. And I enjoyed it. Um, I, I got to do a lot of really amazing things with the uh, Department of the Army, lots of presentations at the Pentagon. It was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I was just not satisfied um, with that field. I was an extrovert and engineering, unless you're doing presentations, you can be uh -huh. sort of more secluded in the design world. And, and that's a great fit for some, but I was really a people person at that point in my life. And I really, I enjoyed project management, but I really um, it just wasn't as satisfying. And I started getting this tug uh -huh. on myself as a young, I was, I was in my late twenties at the time about really feeling called to work in the church to do something, I, um, I really, I grew up in the church, but I, I, I wasn't very strong, I would say, in that area of my life, but I began to get a, get a tug to really give back to the world, and I didn't know what that looked like, and so I ended up uh, working in a church in San Antonio, Texas, a large church, and, and in that experience, ended up going to seminary. I actually went to seminary at Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Austin. Gotcha. Um, yeah, and so that really led me down a different journey. Um, yeah, I can I, bet. Never, I didn't feel called to work in the local church still. It, re yeah. it, just, it really wasn't it for me. I did do that for seven years. <laughs> uh -huh. But I really, uh, when I was in seminary, um, you know, I don't know, you can call it what you want, a voice from God, something. Right. I want you to open a women's shelter, you know, and uh -huh. so I did. <laughs> wow. So I ignored it for a long time. I, mm. um, I got to, I got to know a nun um, who was working on her doctorate and she lived in San Antonio and had done a lot of work with violence against women and started a small shelter called Visitation House. And so I started doing work with the women who were coming out of domestic violence there, volunteering, and just really finally decided that, um, okay, it's time for me to do this kind of work. I, I, yeah. I was very convicted by it. I, I will share a little, I'll be a little bit vulnerable of that as a young a young girl, I was raped. Uh -huh. And um, it was, a, it was a sort of a horrific experience in my life. And I, I knew the power of sexual assault on a woman or on any individual, of course, um, the power of that and the ability to try to live through that and regain confidence in yourself and mm -hmm. uh, believe that you have value. And so that really is what drove my ultimate vocation, I would call yeah. it, um, all the way from engineering to running a shelter. Um, right. I still serve as a clergy and, and I'm still building bridges if you want to use that okay. metaphor from the church yeah. into the world. Uh, I'm still creative as I was in architecture because every day is a different day and I you know effectively with about 500 other people <laughs> gave yeah. birth to an organization that I think is doing some really good work in the world. Oh yeah. So no, that's no, kind no. of my journey. Yeah. Uh -huh. So kind of you know walking back with it a little bit what was how big was the difference between engineering school versus seminary school like did it translate you know because I, I think there's definitely the stereotype that engineers probably work the hardest in college which is probably true so did those skills really translate to seminary or did it you know was the time off difficult for going back to school what was that like yeah, I think that's a that's a great question, and um, I don't I don't think every you know, and I don't I don't know what my particular skill set is, but I really think I kind of am a left right brain person. Um, I, I um, and not everybody you know, some people are just really more in the liberal arts world, and some are definitely more science oriented. I've always kind of been a little bit of both, I guess, and so that helped me navigate a lot of my. I think one of the greatest assets that you get from an engineering degree that translates into any field and that is the ability to solve problems yeah. and in a, in a rational logical linear way right and uh -huh. so problem solving is a really important skill set um no matter what field you go into right being right. able to take a mess to take chaos and to to lay out uh solutions and, and uh -huh. so that translated really well for me into opening Magdalena House, being able uh -huh. to be thoughtful. Um, the di there's a difference, there's certainly a difference in um, engineering and um, the, you know, seminary is considered a liberal arts type field, right? right. And so it t perfect uh, writing is the number one thing, right? I mean, as an engineer, you do technical writing, um, as a, but as a seminarian or anybody in the liberal arts field, you're writing, um, you're writing prose, you're writing narratives, you're writing- A little writing more creative than- much more, It's a little yeah. different. Um, but there's still a logic involved, right? Even mm -hmm. in seminary, you know, I, I'm a science person and I um, right. I was able to navigate that very easily in seminary. Uh -huh. um, 
Yeah, so there, there is some difference. You also, the other big difference as engineers, oftentimes th there's not, there can be a public arena for an engineer, depending mm -hmm. on what they ultimately end up doing. A lot of engineers leave the purely design work and go into project management and, and, and right. leave that pure technical field behind. Uh -huh. it, it, in, in seminary, you, there's, a, there's a public speaking piece, right? I mean, you have uh -huh. to be comfortable speaking. And not all engineers who are comfortable in the design room necessarily would want to do that. I, yep. I, I, a lot are, though, you know, it just really depends on the person. Yeah. Uh -huh. So then you said that you graduated from seminary and you started working as a clergy for about seven years before starting the Magdalena House. So take us through what it was like actually having to, you know, be like, okay, I think I feel convicted, I'm ready to start this. What was that, you know, initial decision, like getting it off the ground, boots running? a great question um and you know i just really wasn't sure what i, I knew that i didn't really belong in the local church as like a, a pastor leading a church i really wanted to be in um in the community advocating for for those particularly for women right i did a lot of feminist theology and, and pastoral care for women in seminary that was my focus really for all my electives um and so i knew i wanted to advocate for women who were not feeling empowered who right. didn't believe they had value. And so um, as I started doing that, I, I started to, to get from the local church to opening a shelter. I started, uh, I started telling people, I'd say, you know, we should open a women's shelter. What do you think about that? And I tell like different people. And then one day I had sort of the matriarch of this faith community come up to me and she's like, Denise, I think we should open a women's shelter. And I was like, boom, you know, there you go. We're done, you know, I, I, know, I know it works. And so I really started a grassroots movement. Um, I had a man walk up to me one day and just say, Denise, I think you should open this women's shelter. Here's $10,000. And I'm like, oh, oh my okay. God. Wow. It's like, seemed like, that's like, I got so much money to me at the time. And, and, oh. um, and so that's really, I just, it was really through relationships that I was able to do it. And then I'm just gonna tell you in terms of opening a nonprofit, I think starting it out of the church of 6,000 people is, is a really a good way to do it. Yeah, that I had like... a support base. I'd been in that local congregation for 20 years uh -huh. as a lay person and as a clergy person. So I already had relationships in place with significant donors, right? Mm -hmm. People that believed in me, they believed that I could do what I said I was gonna do, that I would follow through. So, you know, I didn't just go out down the block and say, hey, I think I'm gonna start a nonprofit. I don't right. know anybody in the community. I don't have any relation. You know, that just, it'll never fly, right? I mean, it's got to be like the greatest idea on the planet, you know? Mm -hmm. But, um, and then the other thing, I started a nonprofit in a field that's not controversial, right? I mean, sure. it's not a controversial world. Nobody really wants to see women beat up or children abused or molested, um, human trafficking. There's not many people in favor of it, you know? And so, well, it, yeah. you know, I, I, I will say that I, I, I took risks, right? There's always risks involved in starting any new organization. Most nonprofits die within a couple of years, mm -hmm. but I didn't take a risk on the subject, on the content, right? Mm -hmm. It's a subject that everybody's against. Right. Domestic violence, nobody wants to see it, you know? Yeah. And the other thing is that, you know, there's probably about two degrees of separation mm -hmm. between an individual and somebody they know that has been abused by a um, intimate partner. And I, I think that's probably the more common phrase now, intimate partner violence instead of domestic yeah. violence. So, yeah. So, you know, how did you choose like where the location you want to center it is? Like how are you choosing yeah. real estate for it? How are you gonna start building? Cause obviously, you know, you can't really just be, it's not just you running it. How, how do you form this team or was it just you running it for a while? Right. That's a great question. And so I got some really smart people around me. And that's what I did. I had a retired physician who, who came up to me. She had been practicing in San Antonio for about 40 years and said, I heard you're starting a shelter. I want to help you do that. She had connections all. Through. I mean, she was much older than me, had right. lots of medical connections. My husband's a physician. I had medical connections that way. The right. church, I had lots of connections in there. And I had multiple disciplines like CPAs, attorneys, Mm -hmm. um, social workers, behavioral science folks, uh, mental health folks. I, mean, I also found a woman who happened to be, she was a CEO of a hospital. And she's like, Denise, you need to create a business plan. And I said, well, I don't even know what a business plan yeah. is. <laughs> so right. that, um, that was really the first thing we did is I, I called a meeting, an open meeting of the church. I don't know. I had hundred, hundred plus people show up that wanted to be on the task force. Oh. And then, um, I broke it down into small groups, right? We, you know, we 
these problem solving. I was able to broke it down. These are the tasks we have to accomplish before we even present it to the church to be approved. That engineering you know, mind starts. Yeah, yeah, so I started, you know, we broke it into manageable tasks, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to start a nonprofit. You know, so what are the manageable tasks you can break right. it down into, right? And who's the, who has the right skill to manage that small mm -hmm. task? Like, yeah, wasn't going to be me on everything because right. I didn't have the skill set, you know, I, right. I'm not an accountant. I'm not, you know, so I had a CPA who'd done work for a nonprofit, but she helped set up, this is how you need to do your books. You know, I had, we did this business plan and the CEO is fabulous because she had done large hospitals. I mean, she knew everything about structuring a business. You know, I, yeah. I was an engineer. I, I, they don't teach you that as an engineer and, or mm -hmm. in seminary. And so I needed business. I needed really smart business men and women around me. Mm -hmm. Um, and people with connections to deep pockets, that's just the honest truth. And so, yeah. um, you know, you can't write grants for a, for a burgeoning nonprofit. Nobody's going to give you much money. There's a little bit of startup money out there. You could probably convince somebody that you're viable, but usually to get any significant money with the foundation, you have to have proven, you have to have a proven track record. Right. Nobody's going to give you money and think, well, they're going to be dead in 12 months anyway. Why would I give them any significant money? You mm -hmm. can't get federal dollars. That's completely yeah. out of the question, you know? And, and, um, and so that, that's kind of what I did. I started with a task force. I found the right kind of leadership to lead the small groups. Mm -hmm. I did a business plan and then I presented it to the 6,000 member church and they unanimously approved it. And so we functioned under that umbrella of that congregation initially uh -huh. because we weren't a nonprofit yet and we needed a way for people to contribute and be able to write off their donations. Uh -huh. So they gave to, a, you can give with a, you can do designated giving, right? In the faith community. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we did that for about a year and then we applied for our nonprofit status and became a separate nonprofit. Gotcha. And then, so once you actually became a nonprofit, obviously there's tons of nonprofits all across the country. And a lot of those, uh, there are people lot. who make a lot of money in those nonprofits. You so, don't. but you, yeah, exactly. In most cases you don't. So, but how do you make any money to begin with? How does it, the, how do you keep it running and stuff like that? Pay for all the operational expenses. People just started giving money, right? Okay. People, because I had existing, I gave, I started out of a group of people that I already had a 20 year relationship with. Right. So they were willing to write checks. You know, they knew that I was starting this, so they would write checks and they would designate it to Magdalena House. And so uh -huh. then, the, then I had to find, you asked the question about location. That's a really good question. I mean, location mm -hmm. is a really important thing, particularly for a women's shelter. So yeah. it, you know, you can't just pick a strip mall. I think we'll open an office, an empty, here's an empty, you know, storefront. Right. You, you have to find a place that can house families, right? Mm -hmm. In a safe way, secure mm -hmm. way. So that's a speci very specific location. And so I, I was having coffee with a friend of mine who was a clergy person. He's like, Denise, I got this couple, these two doctors, and they, um, they bought this five acre property with a house mm -hmm. on it. And they just want to use, they want someone to use it that can do something good in it for about mm -hmm. five years. And then they're going to sell it as an investment. And so I said, do you want to meet him? I said, yeah. And so I met Dr. Pam and Randy Otto and they were mm -hmm. like my angels. Yeah. They said, yeah, you can, we'll rent it to you for a dollar a year for five years and then we're going to sell it. You know, so you got it for five years tax, you know, free, you pay the property, you know, we, we helped you, we would, we, you know, they had to pay property taxes on it. And so uh -huh. um, it was just like, a gift right because i had priced out some other like vacant apartments and mm. old nursing homes um a, a, a foster care facility that had an empty building and they were going to charge me seventy thousand dollars for the very first year to use this Jeez. space that i could put about 12 families 10 families in and so mm -hmm. it's like Ugh, you know i don't want to i don't want to do that you know i don't have the money you know right. so anyway i rented the space we we started with one house on five acres and it had four bedrooms and we put four families in it. And that's how we started. That's amazing. Yeah. And so then, uh, so say you're an 18 year old, uh -huh. you get involved in nonprofit and stuff like that. What was your recommendation? Do you think it's just, you know, going to like, how do you find the different ones you want to get involved in? Maybe if you're not exactly sure what you think. I'm into. Right. Well, I think that that only the person's going to know that. So I believe in something, right? I believe in vocation. And I don't, I don't mean just in the church. I think every human being is called to something very particular, right? Uh -huh. And you may spend a lot of years trying to figure out what that is. Right. But you know, in Latin, it's called, the word is vocare, to call out. And so a lot of people will say that a person's vocation is where the needs of the world intersect uh -huh the needs of humanity, right? I yeah. mean, in that place that gives you ultimate joy, the needs of humanity, I'm sorry, uh -huh. the needs of humanity or the world intersect that place 
that just gives you joy. And, I, and there's a difference between joy and happiness, right? I mean, there's this, because we're not always happy, right? That's like, you know, but, we, but where you find this deep joy, right? This, this ability that like, you know, I was, I was working in, ch in the children's nursery, you know, mm -hmm. or I was volunteering for an after school program with kids and I had so much fun. I just loved it. You know, I wanted to go back. And so, you know, that might, if, if that happens over a period of five or 10 years, then maybe you really do like working with kids. Mm -hmm. Or maybe if you are going on, if you're working with Habitat for Humanity and you love constructing homes you love putting houses together i mean you're good at it right i mean it's well maybe you're not the best at it but you you want to learn right and mm -hmm. but you just get a really a lot a big kick out of it you know mm -hmm. maybe that's the field that you should be in and, and, and yeah. maybe it's to build buildings for a profit and that's okay mm -hmm. but there's probably something in that same profession um that you can connect with a, a hurting world right where a need of the world and um and satisfy both the joy that you get from it and serving other people. I mean, I'm really kind of big on that, that we are, we're called to, to a work of service in the world. And I think if, if we all were, the world would be a better place, right? Yeah. People have to make a living though. Don't get me wrong. You know, my husband's a physician and he's not giving his time away. I can promise you that. Mm -hmm. So I know that, you know, we have to make a living. People are deserve to be paid. The nonprofit industry fights that mythology all the time. Like there shouldn't be overhead there. You should work for nothing. Well, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I have to eat, right? My children have to go to school, you know? And so, you know, there, people are doing benevolent work should be paid, you know? Mm -hmm. Usually we're not paid as much as private industry. You know, my starting salary as an engineer, you know, it took me several years as a nonprofit executive director to get back to that place. But um, I wasn't quite as emotionally satisfied as an engineer as I am as running a shelter for children and, and for mothers. Then what does your you know day to day look like? Obviously, there's no you know similar. There's no situations that are the exact same. It's so different. So is it really even able to condense what a typical day looks like, or do you really feel like every single day you wake up to something that looks you know totally different? What is that? Well, and I want to say before I even answer that, you bring up something really important, which is when you're looking at what is what you are called to do, what your vocation is. I think you have to decide. Like I I thrive just a little bit in chaos. Right? Right. I'm okay with chaos. I'm okay with not having all my work done at the end of the day. I'm okay a little bit with disorganization around me. I'm okay with not knowing the answers, right? And uh -huh. so um, some people are not, right? So you need to make sure whatever job you want to do, and there's no right or wrong answer. It's just because uh -huh. you're perfectly made, you're unique, you need to, you need to do something that makes you joyful. Uh -huh. um, so my days are um, I, they're different. Every day is different. And I love that. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, like that was part of my problem as a young engineer is there was, there was such a, there was a lot of sameness in the work that I did. It was exciting. I, I like, I like cranking calculations, but, um, but I finally got to where I wanted to do different things. Right. And so as an executive director, I touch every field, mm -hmm. which is what I love about this role. And um, it'd be difficult to, for me to do something different because I get to get involved in fundraising. I get to get involved in um, uh, recruiting um, of individuals who might be partners with us right because to do that you have to tell the story so I I like telling the story of what Magdalena House does the success that we've had the lives that have been changed I love that right I mean I am sort of a consummate salesman right of something I believe deeply and so I get to do sales that's what development is right and uh, and I get to write I really do love to write because I like to write sermons and so I like to write grants I don't want to be in charge of the grants don't get me wrong because that's a lot of minutiae there's a lot of deadlines that you get but I I love I, I like that part I, I, I like that I like I like doing the finances because I love math right I like like okay like what's wrong our QuickBooks here's all of our QuickBooks and data you know let's figure this out you know what are we doing with designated giving grants blah 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 so I like that I like working with program I like helping people create new things right I don't always like to be the maintenance behind those new ideas or the implementers but I love thinking I love brainstorming right I love empowering my staff right I like seeing them um, have access to training that makes them grow as an individual I love helping people meet their potential right because if they meet their potential Magdalena house will explode and grow right and we can serve more people and I love number one meeting with the women we serve and right. the children we serve without mm -hmm. that I'm dead in the water mm -hmm. right because that's the passion 
that mm-hmm. fuels me. That's what sustains me when I have to do those jobs that I call taking out the trash. Mm-hmm. Right. There's always every single job. There's that, there's that taking out the trash piece. Mm-hmm. You don't want to do it, but if you don't do it, you're oh, in trouble. And, and the organization's going to fail. You know, I hate, you know, prepping for the 990 for our CPA. I don't really like it. There's parts about, um, you know, there's parts about, you know, nobody likes to have a bad conversation with a staff person or nobody has to, you know, I do these covenant reviews with mothers every three times a year. They have to come before me and tell me what they've accomplished. If they met all their goals that they set for themselves. And sometimes they don't. And sometimes they make some really bad choices and it makes me wonder whether they should live at Magdalena house. And I, you know, I, along with the program director have those hard conversations and that's the worst part of my job. But the good part is when they say, you know, no, this, I'm going to do something different. Or, or, or maybe they say, you're right, this isn't the right place for me. But at least it's an empowered decision. So that, that's an idea. I, my days aren't typical. You know, I go, I, I work on the facilities too, right? But then as an architect and as a civil engineer background, when we, when we developed Magdalena House from a, we, we, um, we, uh, refor- we uh, replatted the entire five acre property. How fun was that, right? I got right. to step back into engineering and work with the, you know, those builders, you know, I could talk the talk and walk the walk, you know, don't try to pull this one on me. You know, I could, I could, I could have some familiarity with working with city planners and city engineers, you know, so, you know, it's just been a great ride for me and every day really is different. So I, I thank you for that question. I guess I got a little too excited. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can definitely tell you have to wear lots of different hats, especially. You do, in- you do. For this, for, t- for this particular job. Yeah. yeah so so I don't want to take too much of your time. But my final question I'd really like to ask this is in your years of experience, you know, you've done a lot of things, you've accomplished a lot, but if you could go back to your 18 year old high school self, and give them a token line of advice from the wisdom and the things you've gleaned since then, you know, what would that be? And that's obviously a little bit of a tough question, but. Yeah, you know, I'm mentoring a young woman right now. She's a sophomore in high school. And um, I, I hear, here's some of the words I hear her say that I can hear, I said those things. Mm-hmm. And she says things like, you know, my, and my dad thinks that I should do this. And so I, you know, I, I think I'm gonna go, I think I'm gonna do this. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, my, I was told by this pastor that I should do this. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think I'm going to try that. And so I think the thing I would want to tell my 18 year old self is to try to as hard as you can, as difficult as it might be, is to get inside your head. Mm-hmm. To listen to what's the voice that you hear in your head, right? Mm-hmm. Which is the voice that's directing you, right? I mean, I really, it's hard at 18. Um, to not hear a lot of outside voices and, and some are positive and some are not. Mm-hmm. And so to get to that place where you believe in yourself and that you trust your own decision-making that this really is what I want to try. You know, it, it might not be, you know, to, to be an attorney, you know, cause mm-hmm. that's where the money is, or it might not be to be a CPA, you know, or, um, it might be filmmaking and your parents are going, Oh, please. And my daughter was an art history major and a, a political science and she's an attorney right now. But mm-hmm. I remember when she said art history, she did feminist art history. I'm like, Oh, you'll never get a job. You know? And so I'm like, don't do it. Don't do it. You know? <laughs> but she did it anyway. But you know, so I think it's that, that need to hear your own voice mm-hmm. and, um, and to figure out what gives you joy. You know, what is it over and over? There's something called the Benedictine rule. And there's a, there's a question you can ask yourself as a, a the, the, for discernment it's like when did I have the most joy today and when did I have the least joy today you know you can change the word when did I feel most loved when did I feel least loved a lot of ways you can ask the same question but if you look at your answers over a long period of time you'll begin to get a picture will begin to form of what it is that's going to be the right vocation for you yeah no I think that's I think that's actually great advice and if possible I'd like to sneak in one more question this is on a kind of a different branch but is very timing. So in the, we're in the middle of a pandemic and you run, you know, a shelter where you're probably not going to be able to, you're not able to test people when they're coming in and out. You don't, you don't know where they've been or previously if they've been sick. How does that change what you do? Does it change it in any way, really? That what is, is that? That's the question of the hour. And we, uh-huh. we change protocols about every two to three weeks. Yeah. It's, it's been a nightmare. I mean, all shelters are going through this right now. They're changing their protocols constantly based on the data that we have. And we, and we really try to look at science. And then, of course, in the, in the state of Texas right now, we have conflicting 
we have some conflicting uh, edicts from whether it's gubernatorial or municipal. Um, we listen, we're listening to local, our local leaders right now. Um, for instance, they're advocating now we're going back to mask wearing. So we follow the local recommendations. We stay abreast of the CDC and WHO, the WHO organizations, and we just try to follow science as best we can. Um, but we have families that live together as basically one large extended family. And so there is involved, there definitely is still involved some personal responsibility. Um, and I don't, I think pandemics are beyond personal responsibility, but, um, but, but because of the shelter site, um, there requires some of that, but we require social distancing. We require masks. We do temperature checks of all the women. Our mothers have to give us temperature checks on a daily basis. For a period of time, we locked everybody's, we took everybody's access out and they were not able to come back into the property without temperature checks. And still today, every day, the, the families call in with all of their temperatures. Um, we also, um, all of our staff, of course, as well, anybody with any symptoms or exposure right. to anyone are not allowed to be on site. Um, so it, it's tough. It's, it's a tough, tough thing. It's, as a shelter, it, there, there is also this idea of how much are you able to um, really enforce, you know, to what degree can you enforce something without just taking everyone's personal freedoms away. So it's a balance. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, I really appreciate you coming on, allowing us to ask questions. Obviously, I know you're solid, but thank you very much. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm thrilled, and I love your. I, I, I'm I'm a subscriber now, so I think this is a great project you're doing for the, for the youth of, or not for young adults. Right. So best of luck to you. Thank All you right. very much. And to our listeners, yeah, you know, keep following along. We'll have more amazing guests like this. Uh, follow us at the Ride Along on YouTube and Instagram. See you guys next episode. Hey, let me. Can I say one thing? Of course, go ahead. Oh, I, you know, I'm, uh, I can't help pitch it. If you want to get involved in Magdalena House, check, us out at, <laughs> check us out at maghouse.org. Uh, we're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. We'd love to get you involved. I know some of you all are up in Austin, but those of you are in this part of the, this neck of the woods, we'd love to get you involved. You're not on site this summer, but come fall. I think we might be back in business. So we'll thanks. Sure you your social media and stuff like that too. So for everyone out there, make sure you're getting involved. Yeah. Awesome. Once again, thank you. Really appreciate it. You bet.